Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. For the next three weeks, we wish to bring you programs on a very, very important topic in our society, and that is the energy crisis. It is many of us uh, uh, a belief that this is the number one issue in America today, that not only does the energy affect the industrial production and jobs in the country, but it certainly is tied to our very high inflationary rate. Uh, in order to do that, we wish to particularly emphasize the area of energy that deals with uh, present consumption sources such as petroleum and coal, hydroelectric power. We will not spend very much time on alternative sources of energy, but rather deal with the uh, present uses of energy. In order to open up that three-week series, I would like to share with you two or three statistics. First of all, uh, most governmental reports and private uh, statistics both indicate that we comprise approximately 6% of the world's population, yet consume about one-third of the world's products. Also, uh, in, while doing this, it is important to import uh, large sources of oil, and about 50% of our use is imported. I would like to share one final statistic from the city services of Tulsa, Oklahoma, when they recently indicated that if we deal with coal in metric tons of coal equivalent, that in the United States, Americans on an average per capita basis in the 1970s uh, used about 11.6 metric tons compared with 5.4 for the average Englishman, 3.25 for the average Japanese, and worldwide only about 2.1. So I think you can see from the statistics how important energy is to our way of life. In order to accomplish this very serious discussion this week, next week, and the following week, we wish to start with part one and invite to our program Linda Bond, who is the field representative and program coordinator of the Spokane office of the Washington State Energy Office. Uh, Linda, welcome to our program. Thank you. She has held that position since 1975. At the close of today's uh, program, we'll indicate who's going to be with us next week. Joining with me in questioning our guests, we have three panel members. First of all is Janelle Burke, who's been with us for the past six years. And for almost that same length of time, another panel member, Dr. Ken Wright, teaching in the field of chemistry at North Idaho College and in the field of anthropology, Richard Snyder. Welcome, panel. Thank you. We'll start Thank the you. questioning with Janelle Burke. Well, Linda, what is exactly the office of uh, the Washington State Energy Office? Where do you fit in the state government structure? Uh, well, as the name might uh, indicate, it's a, a state agency uh, largely responsible for, I guess, overseeing and coordinating energy activities for Washington State. Uh, my role with that agency is to serve as a field representative to people in eastern Washington, particularly in the Spokane area, to supply information to them, uh, help them find who they ought to go to to get help, things like that. How many offices are there similar to yours in Washington State? Which Within the agency structure, there's just the one office in Spokane other than the main office in Olympia. Uh, there are some other projects which have energy offices associated with them. In the state government structure, who do you report to? Who does your office report to? I uh, report from Spokane to the Assistant Director for Conservation at our agency in Olympia, Evan Lewis. And he's what I, you know, he's my boss. And then who does he report to? the director of the agency, Jack Wood. And then is the, is the agency a, a direct part of the governor's office then? Not, not in the sense that you might think. It's a separate agency, however, uh, much of the policy that we work with in that is directly related to the governor. What are some of the goals of your office? Well, primarily I think the goal of the office is going to have to be to try to do our best to see that the state of Washington can survive and if survive have uh, somewhat of a good uh, standard of living that the people in the state want to have for themselves as much as possible. Dr. Wright. Ms. Bond, I'm curious about the growth in your agency. Has your staff uh, grown? I yeah, that's kind of hard to answer. Um, in Spokane, I've had in the past uh, some additional staff members that were working on given programs. 
uh, at the present time I'm alone in that office. The overall staff, uh, permanent staff, has grown considerably as the federal grants have come in and uh, a great deal more money has come to the state. We've had the funding to hire extra people on given programs. There's about a total of 40 positions allowed for our agency right now. Those are all state funded. No, positions? a good number of them are not state funded at all. Uh, they're funded under the conservation programs. Uh, one of the departments has considerable state funding and that's fuel allocations. But most of the conservation programs are paid for by federal monies. How about the demand for the kind of services that your office is providing? You're, you're providing information, I know, for one thing. What kind of responses are you getting now? The demand has oh. really increased. Um, I would say up through about six months ago, we pretty much were out uh, promoting the uh, idea about energy information and going out to people. And now it's about all we can do to take what's coming in. It's really reversed. Richard Snyder. I was born and raised with the great American dream that every boy could own a car and drive it wherever he wanted as fast as he could go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very concerned that I'm not a boy anymore. Uh, in Spokane and the Inland Empire, what's going to happen to my dream about driving my car where I want and the availability of gasoline? Well, as with, with most things, I think uh, the greatest impact is going to be just in price. As the price goes up, some people won't be able to drive as much as they have. Uh, that is something that won't be as quickly subsidized as some things like home heat is. Um, I think I really had expected that the increased prices here lately would have had a, a major impact on what I see in the downtown Spokane area with a lot of the kids and the cars. And surprisingly enough, it hasn't. I don't know if they're getting more money now or, or what's going on, but they're still out there driving around the block. Do you think that uh, the rising cost of gasoline has uh, curbed the consumption of gas or has it begun to conserve the consumption of gas at all? Um, there's conjectures that it has. I, I would say that there are two things that are linked in the gasoline situation. One is price and the other is availability. I doubt that it's possible at this point to look back in a few months and point to one or the other and say it is solely the major cause of being of the cutback. There is a cutback in youth. We know that. But uh, part of it's simply because stations at one point were closing earlier. You just couldn't get as much. What about uh, the federally imposed, well, not actually imposed, but arm twisting of 55 miles per hour? Mm -hmm. uh, that's been in for several years now. And do you know of any effect that this has had on? I can't, I can't quote you figures. Um, we feel in the state of Washington that uh, information that, w that was taken in showed that it was effective enough that it continues to be one of the major items uh, as far as our, um, what, what you would say, enforcing a law that we feel has an impact on energy usage. Uh, well, one final thing, if I may, uh, a question I get in not only anthropology but economic geography courses. Uh, really, the oil companies are stockpiling oil all over the place, and when it gets to $5 a gallon, we'll be swimming in it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know of any major stockpiling of gasoline or home heating oil or conspiracies uh, or anything like this? If there is any stockpiling occurring, I'm sure it's happening in the ground before it ever gets to the point of being gasoline. Uh, there's an obvious thing existing in this country where some uh, supplies are not being developed simply because the price they'd get would seem ridiculous to them to do it. And there's some capping that's gone on. Um, stockpiling, we use so much that I can't imagine the size of the storage tanks it would take to do any kind of major stockpiling in this country. We like to be able to stockpile ahead a couple, three months on many different petroleum products just to be careful because you never know, you know, exactly what's going to happen from day to day. Um, no, I think that what really happens is a very complicated situation which deals with the amount of imports, the type of crude that's being imported. There are many different kinds, different qualities. You can't get the same amount of a given product out of one barrel of oil that you might get out of another of a different grade. And you see a lot of uh, distribution problems. Um, so it's just not a simple matter of how much is there to begin with and how much have we got out here on the market? 
Linda, our program goes so fast and we want to get down to some of the substantive issues on energy sure. now rather than just your office. Uh, since you have to deal with this every day and you get reports from business and from labor and from consumers and others, I would really like for you to take a few minutes to tell us what is the energy picture in the Northwest. I am specifically stating in relation to the rest of the country in the whole question of gasoline and its use or uh, heating fuel oil, for example, or, or hydroelectric power and electricity in our homes, all sources of energy that we use in the Northwest, how do we stack up at this time in relation to the rest of the country? Uh, and our growth rate is rather rapid in Idaho and Washington and Oregon. Uh, give us an overall picture of where we stand on the energy question. Okay, I'll, uh, recognizing time, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I think that in some ways, we in the Pacific Northwest are in a much better condition than many parts of the country. And I say that uh, not strictly from the standpoint of the historic cheap power that we have had, but largely because of some of the new renewable kinds of sources that we've begun to look at developing. Uh, being an agricultural area, we have much to offer the overall energy picture with some new things. Um, that, of course, then, so besides just helping ourselves out with energy, we have the potential for some industries that would also help us in many other ways. Um, we have, however, a situation of being importers of our petroleum products. We have uh, a vast difference between say in, in uh, our state at least, in Washington, the difference between the coast and what they can get over there and the tremendous distances that many of our products come into the, into the Inland Empire. Um, I think probably the thing that we're looking at uh, on the long term or even in the short term is a considerable change in pricing structures in the area. I think that the impact here will not be so much in supply as it will be in the pocketbook within the next year. Past that, we'll need a lot of development. Now you're speaking of gasoline of and, uh, or natural gas for heating and so all areas of uh, the Yes, basically all areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, how about the hydroelectric power picture? We've always been thought of as the Northwest having a rather large supply compared with other parts of the country. And mm -hmm. we, they, they borrow in Southern California from us and we from them at times when it's very cold. Where do we stand there and, is, and what is the development taking place in that area? Well, we've uh, reached a point of uh, still about 80 percent of our electricity now comes from hydro uh, in the Northwest. Uh, the last figure that I heard, I think it's changed a little bit, but at one point nationally that was more like 3 percent of their electricity. So you can see there's a big difference. What we're looking at now is uh, seeing some added generation go into the existing dams. Uh, How many of those are under development now? I looked, there seems to me about 14 projects online in to begin to come online Washington. this year uh, in the Northwest. Um, it's going to, it's pretty much though to the point where even that added capacity in the overall picture is very slight. You know, it's there, something we've got to use and we're going to use, but it's very small. Um, so we don't expect that in the next few years we'll see anything other than hydro becoming a smaller and smaller portion of our overall capacity. And are you saying with uh, hydroelectric power and with uh, gas and with oil and so forth, that's still not going to be adequate to serve the energy needs for the industry in the homes of the Northwest? Are we going to have to use such areas as nuclear energy? Well, you know, this is sort of like the person that predicts a, a hurricane or something. You, you. Uh, suspect that if you predict one and then it doesn't hit, you know, you're a liar. Uh, however, you just assume it didn't hit because you don't mm -hmm. want to see the damage. And I think many of us are in that same kind of position. We would prefer to be able to believe that we can, in fact, count on people and industry uh, to conserve enough that we won't find it necessary to, to go out and, and uh, produce all this expensive power that we're now looking at. But I think even the projections about our potential, most reports expect shortfall, not so much because it's impossible to make it up in conservation, but we just aren't sure how much we can count on in conservation. It's very difficult to mandate conservation because then you end up spending a lot of energy to police the situation. It's much easier if we can get people to do it and work together to do it on their own. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've joined our program in progress, our guest is Linda Bond, who is a field representative and program coordinator for the Spokane Office of the Washington State Energy Office. 
We shall continue the questioning with Jamil Berg. Linda, in the Inland Empire, what are the primary sources of energy? Well, they've, they're changing, but historically, um, Maybe I should ask, do you mean as produced here or as used? Let's start, uh, let's start as produced here and then include as used. Okay, basically uh, about the only production we've had has been hydropower. Very little of anything else. We're very much a net importer of power into the state. Um, we have to bring in our petroleum products. There's some refinement capacity here, but especially now that we've got some crude oil coming into the state that is too high in sulfur and, and can't be handled at our existing refineries, it sort of takes this long route through Japan and then back again. So in effect, uh, I'd say hydro is about the only major source of energy we've had other than solar. Okay, and, and what other sources would you consider primary at this point? We're now moving into a period that I think a lot of other types of things are going to be used. Uh, wood has really caught on. Now there is, of course, some limit to just how much of that we can use without uh, ending up with it all stripped and nothing there to use anymore. Uh, people are going now into gasohol. That's a field that, because of our agricultural uh, farming and everything in this area, we can do a lot with gasohol production that you can't do in some other states. Where is most of the petroleum coming from? Uh, we get it through uh, ref two pipelines, two major ones in the eastern Washington and in this area. One coming up from the south, I think um, Salt Lake um, refineries, and it's the Chevron, I believe, pipeline comes up through Spokane and then on into Idaho. And then the Yellowstone coming from Montana goes over and ends in Moses Lake. There has been some talk about the Alaskan pipeline. What is the feeling of Washington with regard to that? Uh, the Alaska pipeline is, is bringing crude oil, but it is, as I mentioned earlier, a quality that's too high in sulfur. And unless we make some major changeovers of the refining plants, it has to be sent where they can handle it. Is there any Canadian imported oil at this point? Um, I'm really not sure. I've not uh, had that come up. I think, I think uh, there's certainly the natural gas that's coming in, and there may very well be some oil coming in, too. Matter of fact, I'm sure there would be. Ken Wright. I've got a couple of questions I'd like to hit on, but I think I'm going to have to be selective here. Uh, <laughs> since we're on the topic of gasoline, I'm curious about the rationing of gasoline. Mm -hmm. Where does the State Energy Office, because you can only speak for the state of Washington, where do you stand on, on the topic of gasoline rationing? I know C President Carter's got an emergency program for rationing on the national level. Has the state of Washington got any kind of a program besides, uh, you've got an allocation program, but that amounts to rationing in a sense. Yeah, it, it does. Um, only in the sense, however, that the allocation program deals with a very small percentage of the fuel that's available and what it is used for is to ease emergency situations. You may have an area uh, of very rapid growth and when you go back a year or two and base your supply that they're enabled to get on an old usage pattern uh, where people weren't before, then you have a problem. Um, the policy of the state of Washington is to dislike having to mandate things that affect people's personal lives. It is a very distasteful kind of thing to have to do. Um, there is a federal program that calls for, for control and rationing. I understand that if the state does not have a similar program in place, that that program could be then forced upon the state by the federal government. Um, we do have contingency planning with petroleum as well as electrical uh, needs. And within that, it's not what I would call rationing. It's more control of purchase hours, things of that sort. In other words, perhaps closing stations earlier. Making, uh, in other words, making it uh, less convenient and thus cutting back. But your state is prepared then to, or is capable of meeting the requirements we have, we for have, the federal. We have the capability of putting a program in place to, to uh, cut back somewhat on usage. But whether it would be, it would all depend on just how much needed to be cut back. Richard Snyder. I'm thinking ahead a little bit, and it seems to me a year, two years ago, uh, a local power company was going to fly airplanes over the area and mm. through the use of infrared photography identify mm -hmm. those homes that were trying to heat the entire Inland Empire yeah. <laughs> instead of just their home. And uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, insulating houses, and I believe some states, the federal government, were giving deductions for you 
money spent on insulation. Has this had any effect on, on consumption of energy? I think that uh, it has to have had an effect. Uh, recent figures, and I'm, I'm not crazy about figures because you never know for sure what they're telling you, but <coughs> there was an estimate that the past historic growth in the country of about 7% was now back to about 2 annually. Obviously, there's conservation going on. Now, of course, some of that's mixed in with the gasoline and everything else. I know from the experience of seeing that if a house is retrofitted, that you will save considerable. And I know that, in fact, at least in the Spokane area, a lot of retrofitting has been occurring, whether through a subsidized program as with the low-income weatherization or through people doing it themselves. It, there's got to have been a cutback in the use. Uh, and I have uh, a kind of indirect question. Suppose that you were building a house right now and you could get 8% financing, mm -hmm. ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, what source of energy would you heat that house with? Uh, mm, in other words, me personally? Wh yeah. <laughs> which, which of these sources of energy do you personally have the most confidence in in terms of the future? Well, number one, I'd, I guess I'd have to explain that I would uh, sink my house. I would make it as efficient as possible without the use of energy. If I had my druthers, I would like to build it where I had a small stream and could put in my own generating capacity. Um, I feel that were I building now, I would probably go gas. Natural gas. Mm -hmm. I'd like to follow up on Richard's question with uh, one about your office. You get a lot of contacts from the citizenry, both in Washington and even Idaho, about how they can conserve. The average citizen cannot do much about the policy on OPEC or uh, what may happen nationally, internationally, but if you were trying to save energy, not only for the expense of your own pocketbook, but for our society in general, could you give us this kind of a, a list of things that could be done in the present home when they're not going to be able to build a new home mm -hmm. or in, in the automobile and going to work and so forth? Uh, give us some suggestions that the viewers can use now uh, to conserve in all forms of energy. Well, if, if they can afford it, of course, I think one of the major things is uh, attic insulation. Walls get a little tricky, whether you want to spend the money, and there are some problems with retrofitting walls. Then the next thing is go around the house, and if, if you've got cracks, if you can feel drafts, do something about it. Patch it up, weather stripping, caulking. Windows whatever. around doors. Yes, yes. Storm windows are amazing in this area. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of homes when we were auditing that we found without storms and then some that actually put the storms on and what their bills were like the next year. Mm -hmm. Amazing difference. A lot of heat is lost there. Um, past that, I think a general attitude. Uh, in the past, we've used and used and used and really not thought about it. You don't even stop and think what you're doing. I think a person can be very conserving if they simply think about what they're doing think about the hot water, think about how often they're washing dishes. I do them by hand, it's no problem. I, um, I don't uh, wash a, a pair of jeans every day, you know, by itself in the washer. There's so many things that people can do, just thinking about it. How about in their travel and, and commuting to work and so forth? Well, I suppose I would ask people as much as possible not to travel too far for their vacations. I think there's certainly lots of places in Washington to visit without going cross country. Um, as much as possible. It, the amazing thing is uh, how well you can get along with fewer vehicles in a family. If you car it. You can get used to it, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it help also if you keep your car serviced and tuned Definitely, up definitely. Uh, if you keep it tuned uh, you won't have near the... I, I, I had a car at one point that was really old. There was nothing I could do with it, and I practically watched the gas gauge just fall. You know, it was amazing. And I know it was a mess, and now I'm very careful about keeping it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's great. Janelle Burt. Who are the primary users of energy in the Inland Empire? Believe it or not, the uh, residential sector. Is the number one user? Yes, and primarily because of transportation. Transportation uses more energy up here than anything else, and the majority of that is individual vehicles. I'm sorry. Are we making any headway on conservation? Is there any statistic to indicate that we are more saving now than we were a year ago? Or is our growth, uh, average growth offsetting any kind of conservation that may be happening? 
Well, we got pretty close to, at one point, about an 11 percent uh, cutback during that one drought season. And then, if I remember correctly, I think we retained about 7 percent of that. So there was some right there. And as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they've seen, they believe the growth rate is decreasing about 5 percent. So that's an indication right there. Whether or not uh, it's a direct effect of, of um, people consciously conserving or if it's simply an effect of what's going on with the economy. You know, the economy and energy are well linked together in a lot of ways. How about the agricultural sector? Is that a prime user of energy sources or would you say that that's a pretty uh, reasonable use of energy sources? Well, I think it's reasonable in the sense that, that we expect we want to eat and we want to have our products and it's certainly something that's also value, valuable as an export crop. Um, it, it can be very intensive, and I think that's why one of the reasons that something like the production of gasohol, which can be done right on a farm and then used to actually fuel the vehicles directly, is, is probably one of the most efficient things that can be done. Is another potential is geothermal of mm -hmm. our area? Somewhat. Not as much in uh, Washington, I think, as you have in Idaho, mm -hmm. but they're now looking at the North Cascades as a potential. I'm sorry to close our program, but uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Thank Linda, you. for being with us. Thank the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed our program with Linda Bond, the field representative for the Washington State Energy Office in Spokane. I want to take this opportunity to uh, tell you about next week's program. We will have three guests uh, at that time. Uh, one member will be the uh, vice president in charge of marketing for the Washington Water Power, uh, and he will speak on the hydroelectric power in the Northwest. We'll have Mr. Larry LaRocco, who is a congressional aide to Center Church, talking about the Congress and President Carter's program for energy on the national, international level. And uh, we'll have an attorney, uh, Ray Given, who will discuss the, the rights of consumers and all in relation to utility rates and that kind of issue. I think you'll enjoy our program, and I hope you'll be with us at that time. Until then, have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. <laughs>
in the future, perhaps even now. Uh, can you tell us how much of a shortage there will be? Uh, can the shortage be made up somehow? And if so, where would we get the energy from? I'd be <coughs> very glad to address that question, uh, Dr. Snyder. First, might I uh, mention why we think there is a shortage coming? What is the cause of the shortage? And to do that, I'd like to make reference to a, uh, a graph or a chart uh, that we have here that would help explain the causes. There are basically uh, two major reasons why we're going to see a continued increase in the amount of electricity consumed, even recognizing that we, uh, that there's going to be an appreciable amount of conservation on the part of most everyone. But there are two factors that uh, are going to overcome or in cause an increase that's beyond what we can achieve through conservation. One of them, of course, is the fact that we live in an awfully nice part of the world, mm -hmm. and other people in other parts of the United States are finding that out and are moving into our area in quite large numbers. This is one of the factors that uh, leads, its, uh, leads us to believe that uh, we're going to see continued load growth. The second one it refers to the chart here, and uh, that is the fact uh, the, uh, the uh, distribution of age groups that uh, are in our local population. This actually refers, this chart, to a Pacific Northwest uh, population graph, but it's interesting to note that in the age distribution from the age group of about 10 to about 30 through age 29, uh, I won't, without uh, mentioning numbers, uh, you can see the uh, predominantly large percentage of the population that falls in that 10 to 30 year age group. What are the characteristics of that age group? Well, number one, most of them are getting their training, they're in school, or they're beginning their early careers, and uh, they are just about to move into this group, uh, age group from 30 to 44, or they're raising families where they are the peak uh, consumers of services, including consumers of energy, the, the, this group in here. We see this very large uh, percentage of the population that is moving into that, going to be moving into that age group. Now up in here is another group of population from 45, uh, approximately 45 years of age to 65 years of age. I happen to fall in that age group. This is the group that will be moving uh, out of uh, the job market into, into retirement ranks and uh, be to be replaced by this group down here. There's only one difference, and that is that there's just about nearly a million more people in this group here than there is in the group that's going out. So that means if this group of young people are going to be able to stay in our community, we're going to have to find nearly a million new jobs for them. And that means new homes, it means new industry to support them, and all of the various things, more automobiles, more highways, uh, everything. This is, will, if they uh, achieve the standard of living that we've had here, and there's every reason to think they have that expectation, then we've got to find the energy uh, to supply their needs. And uh, this is why we say we can't sit still. We can't uh, expect that we aren't going to need new energy. Now, where is that energy going to come from? That's the second part of your question. How much of short are we? Mm -hmm. If we could turn to the next uh, uh, chart. I think this is a rather complex chart, but it's an interesting one. It shows uh, where the uh, loads, where we get the present amounts of electrical energy that's produced here in the Pacific Northwest and where the shortages are. Of course, everybody can see that much of our energy, electrical energy here in the, in the Northwest comes from a uh, hydro base, and we're most fortunate to have that hydro base because much of it was put in at, uh, at lower costs when the dollar was worth a dollar, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the energy that comes from this, uh, this area here, from the hydro resources, is rather economical energy. Then we have another block of energy here that's coming from existing thermal projects, and it's more expensive energy, although even this was built at a time when uh, the cost for uh, a thermal plant was much less than now. 
Now we have new thermal projects planned and on the drawing board. There are several of them, and uh, they are being delayed for various reasons. And we will see the first of them hopefully come on uh, in any quantity here in 81, 82, and uh, of course come on in larger quantities as we go across uh, the de decade. This energy is going to be more expensive because the new thermal projects are several times more expensive than the plants that are producing our hydro uh, generation. Now we have one fluctuating, one variable in power generation that is due to, to weather, to, to the precipitation that we receive in the area. In a good water year, we have enough extra hydro generation that we can produce power up to this top line. But in what we call a critical water year, when and this year is not critical, but it's a much it's below normal water year, we the generation capacity is somewhere in between. If we have a critical water year, then the generation curve is going to look like that. The difference between that line and this line, which is the rate at which our load is going to grow, is the shortage or the deficiency of electric energy that's predicted. So you can see what that is, that uh, here uh, in the next two years uh, through 81, 82, if we have good water or slightly less than good water, we will get by. But in 82, 83, 84, certainly, uh, if we have anything, even with, even with ideal water conditions, we are going to be deficient in the area. And if we have critical water, we're going to be very deficient of energy. And uh, these curves are moving up and down to reflect the additional capacity of the new thermal plants as they are scheduled to come on. So you ask, again, where is the power going to come from as we run into these deficient uh, years? Well, obviously, the, we just have to try to find it uh, wherever it's uh, available to us. We have gotten some energy from uh, BC uh, Hydro in uh, British Columbia. Uh, some uh, small amount is available through uh, from uh, uh, Cominco. We have other contracts with California Utilities and others around. Quite often, they're exchange contracts in return for helping us meet our uh, our needs. We exchange some power particularly during peak periods with them. Thank you, Mr. Bakes. We'll have to move on now to Mr. Uh, Larry LaRocco, who is a congressional aide to Center Frank Church. Uh, Larry, I know that uh, your reason for being here today and responsibility that we ask you to, to deal with is the question of energy as a national issue in the Congress and with President Carter and the administration. Uh, from some of the statistics and data that I have, uh, I find that it is most interesting what is going on. We are importing more uh, of our petroleum products each year. We're more dependent upon that. It's tied to the inflation rate, which is very high at this time in the country. I noticed that the profits of uh, the oil companies have been increasing, whereas uh, exploration is declining. I have a two-part question, and I would like for you to take about five minutes on the first part, and that is, what statistics and information do you have to indicate that we do have a serious problem, especially in the field of petroleum, on the national level in energy? Well, Tony, uh, I think it was uh, pointed out in the passage of the windfall profits tax legislation that uh, there's a, a serious problem in this country because of the swollen profits of the uh, oil companies, big oil companies, and uh, the fact that uh, their profits are going up astronomically. Um, actually, they've gone up from uh, $7.2 billion in 1975 to uh, approximately $15 billion last year. It's an an enormous increase in, uh, in profits, yet at the same time the uh, exploration by big oil in this country has uh, actually decreased and the projections for the future are that it, they'll continue to decrease. Do you have any statistics so, on to indicate how, how much they are decreasing or will by 1985 or 1990? Um, Senator Church has stated that uh, even Exxon has acknowledged that uh, uh, in 1978 uh, there was a total of 10.7 million barrels of oil per day um, discovered and, and uh, and that that will decrease uh, by 1990 to 7.2 million barrels per day. So you can see that uh, uh, the talk of uh, unleashing the profits for the oil companies, uh, thereby uh, permitting them to explore for more oil and keeping the prices level, is 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 really um, uh, fallacious and and uh, it's, it's an argument that the the Congress didn't buy. Uh, the president decontrolled oil, domestic oil, and he decontrolled oil uh, from foreign sources. And uh, 
uh, Senator Church did not agree with the uh, move by the president to decontrol the oil on domestic oil. Uh, but he said if we are going to and the president won't uh, back off his position, then we must pass this windfall profits tax Isn't bill. Isn't that being added to as a problem, too, by the fact that importation has been, uh, in the last year alone, a great increase in the price we're paying for OPEC countries? Absolutely. The, the price of oil uh, last year was $45 billion. This year it's going to be $90 billion. So when we're talking about inflation, uh, we have to take this into consideration. We have to take it into consideration with a balanced budget and other things. But uh, those, those simple statistics point to the fact that uh, there's a great deal of uh, oil uh, uh, coming in with, with high prices, uncontrolled prices, and uh, it's hitting you and me and, and every other consumer. Well, in addition to both the international and domestic uh, uh, rise in prices, also there's been some government action that to put a tariff or tax on it, and that increases the price even more. The President Carter's increase is coming in May, I believe. Uh, that's right, and uh, uh, with that 10 per, uh, cent per gallon tax increase proposal, uh, if that does pass the Congress, uh, we're not sure that it will, uh, Senator Church will try and exempt agriculture from that. But uh, I think we have to take into consideration, Tony, that uh, what we're dealing with here is, is the prospects of a trillion dollars in profits over the next ten years at current prices and anticipated prices that would go to the oil companies. And what the windfall profits tax does is it takes a portion of that, recycles it back into the economy for the uh, development of new energy sources. This is just not given back for social programs. This is an attempt to uh, develop new sources of energy in our country and take a portion of that trillion dollars that will be uh, accumulated. Some people are on the impression that we, uh, through the windfall profits tax, we're taking away from those companies all this increase. So what percentage are we taking back in the form of this tax that's just passed by the Congress? And I believe it's 23 percent that will come back and then be um, uh, brought back into the economy. Uh, there will be uh, tax credit provisions that will uh, uh, allow for um, the installation of geothermal, solar and wind generation uh, equipment. And these are for businesses, too. And cogeneration, so important in uh, northern Idaho, where they can use biomass and wood waste and so forth. Um, it has to do with uh, gas haul projects, uh, wind development. The whole gamut of alternative sources of energy that we've been talking about for 10 years has finally come into fruition with this bill. So we can say clearly that the bill indicates that all that money is not going to be spent in welfare programs, whatever, but it's actually going to be used, some of it, for alternative sources of energy. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So we will have that money spent on those alternative sources. Absolutely. We will, and, and uh, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, the taxes have already been uh, placed on the profits starting with the first of the year. It's retroactive to that time. And um, the Department of the Treasury will have to file the regulations, of course, uh, 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 under the Act. But uh, by this time next year, I think people will know where they stand in terms of the businesses, knowing whether they can take certain tax credits for uh, certain innovative uh, energy saving mm -hmm. uh, devices and programs. Yeah. In addition to the money that's come from windfall tax profits to go into energy, what else is happening either in the administration or in the Congress uh, this year in the form of legislation? Well, um, as I mentioned, the windfall profits tax has passed, signed into law, and it's, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, a bill that uh, has been under consideration uh, since December in a conference committee is uh, a bill known as the Synthetic Fuels Bill. This bill has a number of titles in it that uh, will greatly uh, enhance our ability to deal with uh, the energy problems also. Of course, the Synthetic Fuels Program is a program that would deal with shale and uh, with gases and uh, turn these types of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, commodities and uh, minerals and so forth into uh, uh, petroleum products and uh, liquid fuels. Also in that bill is Senator Church's gas haul bill, which is critical. It'll be the only major piece of legislation that goes through the Congress this year dealing with gas haul. It uh, will set up uh, an office within the Department of Energy that will help establish targets for the production of alcohol as a mode of fuel, we'll set up loan guarantee programs and make the uh, government the purchaser of last resort um, so that we create a market and we get on with this uh, production of gas -ohol, alcohol. I know Senator Church and, and Senator McClure both have pushed different forms of gas -ohol. We hear some criticism of that uh, particular program uh, from the viewpoint that it uh, takes energy to produce gas uh, the, the alcohol in particular. What is the answer to that? It, how much does it consume in energy to produce the energy? Well, uh, these arguments are getting weaker all the time. All you have to do is uh, look at the gas pump because the, uh, the price is going up all the time. So the, that uh, the existing technology that we have is becoming more economical. Uh, I'm told that uh, the price of gas at the pump 
uh, was increased by four cents the last month. So it's increasing, so it makes it more cost effective. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that uh, there are people who just sit back and they say we can't do it now with existing technologies and they're not willing to take the step forward to, uh, to come up with programs and, and new innovative uh, approaches in technology to deal with the program. There are new enzyme processes that uh, break down the total stock of corn and, and uh, uh, the actual stock uh, and the uh, cob and so forth and it deals with the whole plant. There are new hybrid uh, sugar beets that we can deal with we can actually make alcohol from um, refuse in the cities. And of course, here in northern Idaho, we're very concerned about using uh, wood waste or methanol, so that uh, that's just going to lie out in the forest, uh, and uh, we can use a lot of things. But I think what we've got to do is look ahead. We've got to get involved. We've got to get things, these things off the ground, because uh, if we're going to save 10 percent of our uh, resources by 1990, we better get on with it. One final question, then we'll have to move on to our next guest. Uh, I've noticed from some statistics I have that some of our major petroleum companies are uh, investing some of their profits in things other than energy. Mobile has bought Montgomery Ward for $1.7 billion, or Exxon bought Reliance Electric for $1.2 billion. Do, does Senator Church or, or McClure or any other members of the Congress have any proposals that uh, would try to get more of this money into the sources of energy that we need? The, actually, Tony, the windfall profits tax bill does that because uh, the, the argument against the windfall profits tax has been that the oil companies will take their profits and they will simply put them into exploration and development of new sources of energy. And uh, the examples you just gave shows that it's not true because they're buying uh, other companies. There, uh, there was an offer made by a major oil company to buy uh, Ringling Brothers Circus. Now, that's not an oil uh, producing venture at all. And uh, th we've just got to get on with it. Mobile Oil bought Montgomery Ward for $1.7 billion. And uh, so they're not putting the money into development. And uh, I think what we've done and what the Congress has done with the uh, windfall profits taxes okay. is steered in the right direction. We will now ask Dr. Ken Wright of North Idaho College to interview uh, our, our guest, who's an attorney, Mr. Ray Given. Mr. Givens, your area of expertise is uh, primarily electric utility rates. That's, that's correct. Yeah. So I'll try to confine my questions to that area, although I may get a little outside of that arena now and then. It's uh, certainly a well-established fact of life that we've had a steady increase in the cost of electricity to the consumer over the last five to seven years. And we're told by the utilities that's going to continue to go up at a pretty steady rate, and we're likely to have some shortfalls despite these increases in price. I'm wondering if you can tell us why you think uh, the electric utilities in general and Washington Water Power Company in particular, since they're the main power supplier for our region here, seem to be so opposed to the reform of our traditional rate structure. Well, uh, I think utilities generally are uh, a conservative establishment, and uh, any conservative establishment is going to be kind of is going to question change. Uh, Washington Water Power has been better, a lot better than many utilities uh, in restructuring the rate structure to encourage conservation. Uh, and to try and, and limit excessive consumption. But uh, it's my feeling, and it's, it's the feeling of many of the people I work with, that uh, they haven't gone nearly, nearly far enough. What kind of changes would you like to see the Utilities Institute to, uh, to re really affect the reform in our, in our rates uh, and, and provide some equity? Well, the, the absolute cheapest way of, of providing for new energy is it really is conservation. It's used in less other places, uh, so that you have enough to, enough electricity to go around. Uh, probably two things you can do: one, weatherizing homes, that kind of stuff. But you're told, well, spend money to weatherize your home, so you'll save money. And after a while, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the other thing that can happen is is industry. Uh, has an incredible potential to generate its own electricity or to conserve electricity. There's an awful lot of heat, for instance, going up the stacks at Bunker Hill. Uh, Bunker Hill is getting its power very, very cheaply, and uh, there's, there's no incentive to conserve. The, I personally feel that, uh, as uh, was shown by, by the graph a while ago, a huge amount of uh, Washington Water Power's power is, is hydro, and that's produced very, very cheaply. And uh, 
You know, ever since I've been a little kid, I've always been told that the streams and the rivers and the lakes belong to the people. And that's basically the law in the state of Idaho. And it seems to me that the power that's generated from those streams and lakes via the dams, the cheap hydro, should belong to the people. And that should be used to, to provide the residential power. You know, uh, I spent most of my life in Idaho. grew up in, in southern Idaho, moved up here about 10 years ago. And you look at, at Idaho on, in terms of wages on a national scale, uh, it's a pretty poor state. But the standard of living in Idaho during my life has never been all that bad. It's because a lot of things have been cheap. And one of those things that's been cheap is power. And I think that, uh, you know, people say, well, power's a lot cheaper in Idaho than it is in New York, so, we're, you know, you shouldn't worry about the rates going up. Well, I won't worry about it when wages start going up to the level they are in New York City. But they aren't. They're at the level they are in Idaho. And uh, if we're going to keep the center of living in Idaho what it is, we've got to keep power cheap for the people. And to me, the, the best way of doing that is to give the residential users the cheap hydropower and to make the commercial users who can pass those higher costs of doing business, power is a cost of doing business to uh, someone like Bunker Hill, just like uh, labor is a cost of doing business to them. So uh, pass the higher cost of the new energy, the, the coal or nuclear energy, pass it on to business who could just can then in turn just absorb it in their general cost of business. Uh, many people who consider themselves to be experts in the field of energy have told us that there's a uh, very high correlation between energy and jobs. That if you have a certain amount of energy, you can create a certain amount of jobs with that. If we lose the energy, we're going to lose those jobs. Uh, do you agree with that? No. Can you tell us why not and when, where you think uh, the fallacy lies? Well, I guess your question is pointed at is, is the, if energy costs of business go up in Northern Idaho, are jobs going to go away? And uh, no, they aren't, because even if energy costs go up in northern Idaho, northern Idaho is still going to have cheaper energy than anywhere else in the country. Um, you look at a plant like Bunker Hill, for instance, that uses huge amounts of energy. Bunker Hill uses almost as much energy as all the residential users in northern Idaho in their lead and zinc plants. Uh, are they going to go away if the cost of electricity goes up? No, they're not going to go away because labor is cheaper here than it is in most other parts of the country because of environmental controls if they try and build a new plant in other parts of the country, uh, just because of the incredible cost of trying to build the plant that they have now. Uh, so there, there, there are too many other factors. Uh, you probably will not have the incredible growth of new industry, energy intensive industry, like the aluminum plants, uh, more bunker hills coming into this area, but you know, maybe we don't want those anyway. It's generally acknowledged that uh, electric energy is what everybody would call a high-quality form of energy and therefore should not be used for such things as space heating. Recently, the Idaho Public Utilities Commission tried to inst institute a surcharge to uh, make new homes that were going to install electric heating have to pay a considerable initial cost. Uh, this is presently in the courts, I believe. Maybe you can clarify this point for us. And why uh, do you think this is a good idea? And if not, why not? Well, many of the people that I, I work with uh, like this idea. And I guess possibly it makes pretty good economic sense. It discourages use of heating for, for electricity for heating. Personally, I don't like it. Um, the I think it's, it, it is, it, it's bad social policy when uh, when Bunker Hill stops using electricity to heat those furnaces they have up there, uh, then I think you ought to be telling people, okay, you've got to stop too. But until uh, that sort of thing happens, uh, people, need, people need to stay warm in the winter. And uh, that's the, the easiest way of doing it. Now, I think with, with things like what uh, Larry LaRocco was talking about with the spinoffs from the windfall profits tax, you're going to see a lot of a lot more solar projects, solar heating, solar hot water heating, and I think that's that's very very good. Uh, the Idaho Public Utilities Commission, oh, I think it was the 21st of April, came out with with a brand new energy plan, and they basically said let's stop building big new coal plants. Let's put a lot more in effort into solar hot water heating, solar space heating for homes. Uh, small power production, 
and I think this is, is definitely a step in the right direction. I think it's a better approach than simply trying to stick a new hookup charge for new electric space heating. How are they going to encourage that, though? The Public Utilities Commission doesn't build anything. They just set policy. Well, uh, they have to approve uh, coal fire and nuclear plants that are built in Idaho. They basically have to approve any generating plant that is built by Public Utilities Commission. I must interrupt. I'm afraid the clock has won again. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, it was a very informative program. Ladies and gentlemen, our guests have been uh, Mr. Rich Bakes, who is the Vice President of Marketing and Consumer Relations for the Washington Water Power, uh, Mr. Larry LaRocco, a congressional aide to Senator Frank Church with his office in Moscow, Idaho, and Mr. Ray Givens, who is an attorney in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, gentlemen, once again, thank you. I hope you'll be with us again next week when we will have part three in our final program on the energy crisis of the energy symposium that we're conducting at North Idaho College. Our guest will be Mr. Tug Wilson from Santa Fe, New Mexico, who will be speaking uh, on behalf of the Independent Petroleum Association of America on the topic of energy. I hope you'll be with us at that time. Uh, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. <laughs>
why has the price of petroleum products, especially gasoline and, and oil, which is what most people consume, taken such a tremendous leap in the last two years? Well, there are, it's, it's a complicated answer. But the, the quick answer is that the controls that the federal government had placed on oil and gas in this country were released or are being released now. The big jump was caused by the fact that the that oil and gas had been controlled at a price below its economic value, in other words, what the real-life market price would have ordinarily been. Um, the consumers uh, who, in the name of protection, were protected right out of their supply of oil and gas and that the companies like ours, as well as the majors now, uh, just were not able to drill for oil and gas uh, for years and years and years uh, profitably. Isn't it true that the uh, OPEC nations have had a lot to do with the present situation? Aren't they responsible for? Well, not entirely, no. I think the, um, we gave the OPEC nations the hammer ourselves, and it was done by the, by the federal government primarily, the eastern, uh, primarily the eastern uh, establishment of, uh, of congressmen and senators in the name of protecting their consumers, um, started uh, an increasing dependence on foreign oil. In the, in the 50s, really, it started importing in the 40s, but 50s and 60s slowly but surely built up our dependence on foreign sources. In other words, we gave them the hammer to use on us, and they've used it very effectively. Richard Snyder. Oh, I suppose the first thing that comes to my mind is the windfall profits tax. Now, uh, I'm driving 55 miles an hour, paying an arm and a leg for a gallon of gasoline, and someone comes along and says, here's a windfall profits tax, and we're not going to let them make all that profit, this big oil business. Is this really true? Is the windfall profits tax going to uh, hold down the price of gasoline, or is it going to muck it all up? Well, the windfall profits tax is probably one of the best sold tax legislation packages that's ever come out of Washington. It has nothing to do with oil company profits. It's a sales tax. And the sales tax is paid by the consumer. And we feel, we in the industry feel, that the consumer is getting stuck again for previous government problems, for previous, previous government mistakes. What the windfall profits tax does is sugarcoat uh, the, an error made by the government a long time ago, which was to control the price of oil and gas. What it was a politically motivated piece of legislation it will force the consumer to pay as the, as the price of oil goes higher and we are paying the market price, the world price, which is dictated to us not by the oil companies but by OPEC. And that's a point that I want to make clear, that we do not control our own prices anymore, which is uh, too bad. But to get the de-control of oil uh, past the House and Senate, the Politicians decided that the public would want to have some kind of tax uh, to tax away the profits of the oil companies. That is what that is what people were told, and it's simply not true. What it is is a an excise tax, a sales tax on gas, which takes away the capital that would have been used by oil companies to drill more wells, to become less dependent on the Arabs, to have uh, control of our own destiny as far as energy is concerned. Um, <coughs> and with that imposition of tax, which goes up to 70 percent of the increase that you and I are paying as consumers, goes into the government for their uh, distribution and their, and their wisdom. So the consumers are paying more for less oil drilled up in this country. Uh, to me, it's a grave error. I don't think we're going to get away from the problems we're facing now until we stop making political solutions to economic problems. And so. Uh, I think it's a grave error that we've been sold. I, I, I'd like to follow up with something from our last program in which one of the participants uh, sort of challenged an idea you had. I don't know the solution. Mm -hmm. um, if free profits are the answer, uh, his comment was, why is it that the Mobile Oil Corporation can spend well over a billion dollars to buy Montgomery Ward? Uh, because he didn't think there was any oil in Montgomery Ward's basement. Well, he's uh, exactly right, and I think it's a, I think it's a very clear statement of what a mess the government has made of uh, the industry when a, a professional 
oil finding corporation like Mobil is forced to put its assets, instead of solving the solution that we have directly in front of us, that four years ago they had to buy Mobil, I mean, uh, to buy Sears and Roebucks, and they thought there'd be a better uh, return on their investment from selling shirts than it would be in finding oil and gas. I think that's a, uh, I agree, that's <laughs> a uh, pretty sad commentary on the way it's been handled. Thank you. Uh, Tug, another area we'd like to get into, and you deal with that already today, and that is we hear so many conflicting reports from geologists and, and people in the industry and outside about how much uh, reserves we have of known reserves in this country, petroleum. And uh, I have a several part question. One mm -hmm. is, do we have an inexhaustible supply of uh, oil and gas that, uh, or will we have to go to other alternative sources of energy? Uh, and secondly, for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, what has happened uh, statistically in exploring for this uh, within the United States? Well, to answer the first question, no, we are running out of oil and gas. But to say that we are out of oil and gas now is simply an error. Um, there are studies that uh, petroleum geologists show that only 2% of the possible basins, the sedimentary basins that might accumulate oil and gas, only 2% have been tested. And so that there is lots more oil and gas to be found. The reason why we, we are in a shortage position is because of the price controls that have been put on it uh, that we weren't drilling anymore. And what is the history over the last 10 or 15 years? Well, it's pretty sad. Um, when the price controls were put on, as is everything else that we're all aware of, prices were going up for literally everything. Um, our costs as drilling costs and production costs were going up. The feds, uh, in their wisdom, put a lid on the price. Now, oil and gas exploration is a very high risk situation. Um, it's been getting more difficult and more risky because uh, simple logic would tell you that the easier to find shallower oil has been found. So now we have to drill deeper, which, uh, which is a tremendously much higher cost uh, situation. And so we as independent producers um, really stopped drilling oil wells. And I can talk for our company as a small example of the bigger picture. As I say, there are 12,000 independents. In 1956, <coughs> we drilled 56,000 wells. In 1972, that figure had gone to 27,000 wells. In 56, there were also 20,000 independent producers. It went down to 10,000. So in short, the whole industry was dismantled by this government action. They sold out, uh, checked out of the business. It wasn't worth taking the risk. And that is the source of the problem we're in right now. Now, as your prices have gone up, when, they took, when they've been slowly taking the lid off and allowing the price to go up to its market value, we've been encouraged at that point to take the additional risk to drill the new wells. And as I say, the independents are the ones who stopped drilling for new, uh, drilling new wells, and now we're starting to drill again. And so the higher prices you're paying, which is a, uh, a difficulty for everybody, um, was came very suddenly, so you couldn't plan on it. A lot of us are stuck with big cars that we shouldn't have uh, because we had been protected, in other, but in fact really lied to by, uh, by our government by saying, by keeping the prices artificially low. In addition to that, isn't there also other expenses that are creating a problem? For example, you said today earlier that for every uh, successful well you get, you may dig nine or ten. It's one out of ten, I believe, that yeah, it's an interesting uh, fact that I'm pretty sure is still true, is that for the last 50 or 60 years, one in 10 wildcat well, which is, uh, as I say, the highest risk well, is productive. And that's in view of all the technological advances, all the drilling techniques, all the computer, all the, all the experience we've had. Um, it's still one out of 10. Would you also go along with this uh, statistic? I don't, I'm not familiar with this organization, but it's called the City Service Company of Tulsa, mm -hmm. Oklahoma. And they indicated that in 1978 it cost approximately $260,000 per well, but by 1990 it would cost over $600,000. Is that in the ballpark? Well, the average well is like weighing the average cloud. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the average well is. Um, I can give you a, a personal experience um, that we're looking at a project right now that um, in the 50s we were paying for a 4,000 foot well. We were paying $40,000 for the drilling and completion of that well. Uh, and that is considered shallow in our part of the country. 
Uh, now, the play, in other words, where the oil and gas is being found, is down at 12,000, which is, you have to think of a string of pipe two miles long going straight down. That well now costs $1 million. And uh, it has gone up way in advance uh, of other inflated costs. There's a figure that I've, that I've heard, and I can't really uh, guarantee, but the price of a well doubles every 2,000 feet you drill. And so the costs have gone right through the roof. Um, but as the prices have been increased, and that means the price we are paying at the gas pump and for your heating oil, um, have increased. But the good news is that we're getting more of the wells drilled. And that 50% dependence on highly unsecure, insecure foreign sources is going to be worked down. We are, the more wells we drill, the more oil and gas we will find. And it's a very direct relationship. Um, the people who are saying that there's no more oil and gas to be found are the bureaucrats and the politicians who really don't know what they're talking about. Janelle Furrier. Could you please uh, address the problem of onshore versus offshore exploration and who exactly is doing the offshore exploration as opposed to onshore and why would they be interested in the offshore rather than onshore uh, wells? Well, you, as they say, you hunt where the ducks are. And the offshore structures are big ones. Um, meaning the, the traps that oil and gas get stuck in when they're migrating from millions and millions of years ago. They have found through um, seismic testing that there are some big structures offshore. Now, all the computers and all the technology and all the techniques in the world don't find any oil. The only thing that finds oil is a bit, and it's about that big, and it costs offshore 15 or $20 million to get down there. And you may get down there and find no, nothing there, no ducks there. But you go where they should be. So offshore is um, just a continuation of, of the exploration that's been going on in this country since the 1850s. Um, who does it? Well, simply because of the costs involved. There are not too many independents operating out there. And part of that is the way the government, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, set up the bidding for the tracts of land out there. They're they're forcing companies to put in, put up hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, for the right to try and drill, to try and find oil and gas out there. And somehow, tying up that kind of capital doesn't make much sense. I think it makes a lot more sense to make it more open so you could syndicate those projects and then hit them with success when they find it, when they're lucky enough to find it, then hit them, then take your tax out instead of having these, uh, leases that exclude smaller companies like us, for sure. We, we operate onshore only. The biggest companies with the most capital available to them are the only ones who can uh, play in that game, and, uh, which may not be the best idea. Ken Wright. Mr. Wilson, I want to come back to the profits business of the oil companies. Uh, Mr. Schneider has already asked a question about and alluded to some statements that we had in our last forum. Mm -hmm. uh, the big oil companies, and those are the ones uh, with assets in, SS, in excess probably of a billion or so dollars, have increased their profits since 1975 from about $7.5 billion to over $15 billion this last year. And the evidence is that all that money is not going back into exploration. You're, now, you're telling us that the excess profits thing is really the consumer is going to pay it, but it looks like with decontrolled oil, profits for the oil companies have really gone up. Mm -hmm. They may not be excessive. They may not be obscene. We could argue about that. But they've sure as heck gone up. Yes. Now, if the big oil companies were doing what they tell us that they're doing, that money would be going back into exploration where they could make some more money. Mm -hmm. But yet the evidence is that they are actually are predicting and, and actually have seen a decline in the exploration conducted by the big companies. And they predict that that's going to continue to decline despite the explosion in profits. Now, how do you rationalize that with your statement that, uh, you know, turn them loose and let them have that profit mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll find oil for us? Well, the difference between independents and majors are really significant in that when the, the only game that we play is exploration and production, the other companies, the major companies, the big oil companies that we all know and love to hate, <laughs> um, <laughs> have other options. They have refineries. <coughs> they have other ways to make an investment come back to them. And the fact that the problem is a shortage of domestic oil and that these companies who have the expertise and certainly have the capital to do it are opting not to drill tells me that there's something very wrong with the incentive situation to drill. 
the big profits we're reading about that I understand are not so much from uh, domestic sources. They're from offshore sources. They're from chemical operations that have been losing for years and years and years. The, there, the common misconception is that, that these obscene profits, I, I love the name, I think it was named by uh, your Senator Jackson back in the, in the 75 period. Um, if we were making, if we as an industry were making so much money and it was such a great game and we were being so successful in ripping off the public that there wouldn't be any shortage. We'd get more wells drilled than we needed. Unless it was a monopoly. If it was a monopoly, then I would be concerned about it as a consumer. But since it is not a monopoly and these companies who have options on where to put capital are being discouraged from drilling oil and gas wells in this country, there's something wrong. We're trying to do it. We don't have any options. We as independent producers, we don't have any options. We don't get our money from uh, refineries or somewhere else or have the money to go and buy uh, Montgomery Ward for that uh, case, for that uh, reason. But it seems to me that these companies with options should be encouraged to drill as many wells as possible. And if the, if the rules as they are do not encourage that, that should, be the best, that should be the best game in town right now. We should be encouraged to go out and drill every single well we could. And if the game was as good as it was, the uh, stock market would certainly show what a great deal these, uh, these successful, obscene profits are, are making for their, for their customers. And that's not the case. So there's something wrong with the logic that we're getting. And um, I'm, I think it's time to expose it as, as just that. We're being given uh, misinformation. We've got an incongruity here, though. There's something that doesn't jive. Um, you're telling us that you, you're being encouraged now. The mm -hmm. independents are going back to work. Yeah. The industry's kind of been dismantled because of the poor policies of the past, but you're encouraged to go back to work now. There's yes. some profits out there, again, that you're going to go mm -hmm. after. But the big companies, it looks like, can make more money by importing foreign oil and perhaps selling chemicals and perhaps buying retail stores mm -hmm. than they can by going after oil in this country. Now, how is it that, uh, that you can make money now going after oil and they still prefer to take all this money and go somewhere else with it to invest it. Yeah, that, I, that is the point. And the fact is that they have the option to, to invest where they think it's going to be best. We, we don't. Now, they, uh, to say that they're not increasing their drilling is not, is not so. I think there's some isolated cases that are reporting uh, a decrease in domestic drilling. But the big companies are the ones who are going and finding the, the Baltimore canyons. They're the ones who are spending the $20 million. Now, it'll take us a while to accumulate and find prospects to, to drill up $20 million. They do it in one hole. So uh, to say that they're getting out of the exploration end is, is kind of a distortion. Uh, domestic onshore, they're, le they're le leaving that kind of risky stuff uh, to us. They can go after, they have the capital to go after the, 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 the industry calls them elephants, the big pools. And so they're doing that. They're, they're holding up their end of the deal. But um, the fact that they're discouraged from really going ac active on domestic uh, prospects tells you that there's something wrong with uh, the system as it stands. Victor Smart. I'm very concerned about something. One, I hear you saying that really the oil industry should function in a free market, hands off, let them do their thing in a free enterprise system, and it's all going to work out. They'll be happy. The consumer ultimately somehow will be happy. I wonder if that's really possible given the dependence the United States has on oil for its own national security. Uh, no matter how we got there, the dependence we have on foreign countries to import oil, could we put ourselves at the mercy of our own companies without some form of control? It seems to me that, well, before I get into a second part, I'll stop. What do you think? Oh, I would say no. I don't think um, a completely unbridled anything is, uh, is, <coughs> is a good idea. I don't think we should have uh, uh, complete laissez-faire anything because advantages are taken. I'm a very small company, and I'm in favor of keeping the game fair. Now, you would think that uh, I talk is, uh, when I talk about the big companies, it's really like the corner grocer talking about Safeway. Now, you would think that they would squ squish us right out of existence. I mean, if, it's, if there's ever a David and Goliath situation, is that when Wilson Oil Company is negotiating with Exxon, mm. and you'd think that they would say, get out of the way. You know, if you don't, we'll just swat you away, which they 
you know, conceivably could, but the nature of the industry is that they have to work with us on some deals. They will have a piece of property right next to Gulf or Shell, and they can be big and they can be slow and they can be a pain in the neck to deal with, like paying your utility bills. But they don't um, push us around and they don't push us out of the business. Believe me, I'd be the first to tell you if we were being pushed around. And without any kind of uh, outside regulation, um, I think there's a, a good chance they did that. The reason why the antitrust laws came into effect in the early part of the century is because they were operating as bullies, they were being unfair, they were re in restraint of trade, and I can assure you if they were in restraint of my trade, I'd tell you about it. And the second thing I was thinking, um, I found among my own students that there's a misconcept about business, that, that an oil company is in business to produce oil. No, they're in business to make money. They make money by producing oil. Right. And it seems to me that there must be financial incentive, some profit, because that's what the company is in business to make. And, and can you tie that into windfall profits tax well, and what we're just talking about? Yeah, I, that's why I object so strenuously to the windfall profits tax. Um, I, I continue to call it a sales tax, which puts it in its proper perspective. Um, yeah, there, there had better be a reward for taking that kind of risk. When you think of it in terms of gambling, the odds are terrible in the oil industry. There are only two things that get that bit down there, and that's capital. And it's either derived from profits or it's derived from investors who think that is just a great way to invest some money for a, a good return. Fact is, there haven't been enough profits and there haven't been enough investors to get that drill bit down there, to take that, to take that risk. So now as the prices go up and prices are uh, increasingly decontrolled, um, this is the opportunity now to drill up those wells, to find the oil, to take those risks, to get out from under the thumb of the Arabs. And yet the administration, in its wisdom, uh, sugarcoats this step in the right direction to the, to the, you know, what they must regard as a very ignorant consumer to say, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna protect you all, we're gonna tax away all their profits. Well, A, they're not doing that. That's still a sales tax, no matter what they call it. And if those increased profits that are available because of the, the higher price that we're going to be getting, if that is not put back into the ground, then the, we are not going to get from where we are today, which is in a very vulnerable situation, to that time when alternate fuels and, and uh, substitutes for a dwindling supply of, of energy is available to us. We're talking about getting from here to there. Uh, it's, it's not an uh, a off-the-wall forecast to say that um, this, the time for oil and gas as a primary energy source is definitely numbered. It's too valuable, a chemical feedstock, to be burning it up, literally burning it up. Then uh, that's uh, where, excuse me, we're about out of time. I want to get this one point in because it deals with this. And that is uh, George Bush pushed a program in the Congress which did not pass, uh, I believe called the plowback provision. Yeah. Uh, under the present windfall uh, profits tax, it uh, doesn't matter whether they invest or not, they're going to pay this. But wasn't his program one in which you have the profits, if you take those profits and plow it back in in exploration, uh, fine. If you don't, then we'll tax it. What happened to that program? Why was that not successful? Well, um, I don't know. I think it was a good idea. I think the, the fact is that most companies plow back their profits into the ground anyway, meaning drill more wells. That's the business they're in. But um, if, that, if that had become law, that would have uh, guaranteed that process. It would have guaranteed that more wells would have been drilled, and the, those who went out and bought uh, Sears Roebuck or Montgomery Ward, I always get it confused, Montgomery Ward, would have been penalized. The point is to drill more domestic wells. And if it's taxed away, we can't do it. If it was uh, given a tax break by for doing it, then we'd have gotten a lot more wells drilled, and we would have been in a lot better shape. Jack Anderson is not going to come on Monday morning and tell us where all the oil's been hidden. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt. Our time is up. I want to thank you very much. It's been most informative. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Mr. Tug Wilson uh, from the uh, National Independent Petroleum Association of America speaking about the question of petroleum. This concludes our three weeks on the energy crisis. I hope we've been informative to you. Uh, have a nice week. I'm Tony Stewart. <laughs>
North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.